Good afternoon, good evening and good morning wherever you are in the world and thank you for joining us for the first webinar of Trinity Term here at the Oxford Internet Institute. We have Professor Ian Milligan from the University of Waterloo who will discuss from archives to servers how the internet has transformed historical scholarship. He will be hosted today by Professor Ralph Schroeder, Programme Director of the MSc in Social Science of the Internet here at the OII. A little housekeeping. We are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can ask any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Please try and keep questions as concise as possible. All questions will be visible to all attendees and can be commented upon and upvoted, and we will endeavour to follow up on any unanswered queries. Please allow me to introduce Ralph and Ian. Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, as Isabel said, this is the first seminar in Trinity term, and I'm very, very pleased that uh, Ian has decided to join us. Um, again, he's professor at the University of Waterloo. And I think it's safe to say that he is one of the leading lights in the area that can be broadly called web history. He's involved in a number of different initiatives uh, in this area. Uh, I got to know him because uh, in an edited volume that he did with uh, one of our colleagues from Denmark, Niels Brugger, he wrote a wonderful paper about geocities. And if you don't know what geocities are, uh, you're probably a millennial. <laughs> you might not uh, be able to remember that far, but you should ask him in the Q&A if he doesn't mention it, uh, what it is, because it was the very first online space that we kind of inhabited, I think it's safe to say. And it had a very varied and wonderful history and an even stranger kind of post history. Ian will probably uh, tell you about his fantastic new book, which I'll hold up here, uh, which is also devoted to this topic. It's History in the Age of Abundance. And uh, I highly recommend it to you uh, if he doesn't self advertise it. Uh, but uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Ian, please. And I very much look forward to what he has to say. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that uh, gracious introduction, uh, Ralph. Let me just turn, share my screen. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so thank you very much to Professor Schrader for that uh, gracious introduction. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, you know, the staff at the Oxford Internet Institute for, for making this talk possible and making our webinar possible. And uh, a special thank you to Terry Zhang, a student at the Oxford Internet Institute who uh, I knew from my time at Waterloo when he was an undergrad and he helped, uh, helped make this connection so that I could join you all here today. So thanks to you all. Um, what I'm gonna speak about over the next 30 minutes is from archives to servers or how the internet has transformed his historical scholarship. And the launching pad to this is really my last project. So the book that Ralph held up, History in the Age of Abundance, um, looked at the impact that web archives, such as the internet archive were going to have on histories written about the post 1996 period. But at Q and A's, I was often asked, you know, I'm not a web historian. I'm a historian of, you know, the Italian Renaissance. I'm a historian of medieval England. My work has dramatically changed too. Or a 19th century Canadianist in my department would come to me and say, you know, what you're talking about, about the internet archive and web archives is transforming my work too. And so what I'm talking about today is part of my next project, which is under contract with the new series at Cambridge Elements, looking at the transformation of history in the digital age and looking at what does it mean to do history in the 21st century, whether you're studying the 14th, the 19th, or the late 20th centuries. And because I know I'm speaking to an interdisciplinary audience today, I thought I might begin with two vignettes, you know, outlining how I believe historical scholarship has so dramatically changed over 20 years, or roughly a sort of generation of historical scholarship. And that's because if we go back in time, 
we go to 2001, but again, this could be 1980, this could be 1970. You know, the real change I, I think to me has really come since 2001. That when a historian sat down to do histories of their period, they would do this. They'd choose a project, they'd explore the secondary literature, find a historiographical niche. They'd find their primary documents by looking at what other scholars had cited, phoning or arranging interviews with subject specialist archives or institutions, or they'd actually use these like massive tomes which aggregated resources so you could find the archives you might need for your project. They'd get on a plane, they'd travel to the archive, they'd do their in-person research for months, they'd complement it by months in the microfilm room. And if we had to sum all this up, I would say that it cysts. Research was slow and labor intensive, characterized by information scarcity. That historical scholarship in this really pre-internet period, you know, pre-mass digitization on the web period, was really an overall economy of information scarcity due to the time and expertise required to navigate information. Historians had to choose their archives relatively sparingly. They had to be very careful and deliberate in the microfilm reel that they were going to invest weeks into reading. But information was still mediated. Archives had clipping files, periodicals had indexes, archives helped co-create our knowledge. But in general, research was slow and painstaking. Now, if we flash forward 20 years to today, I think by comparing the historian of 2001 with how our work looks today, 20 years later in 2021, can help demonstrate how dramatically things have changed. At 20,000 feet, it kind of looks more or less the same, i.e. historians still use archives, we still publish in journals and books, but once you zoom in at what our scholarship actually looks like, you can see that the day-to-day -day work of a historian and how we create historical knowledge is dramatically different. And that's because the internet has transformed every aspect of historical work. So if we go back to that first slide where I showed you what a historian might be doing in 2020, 2001, we can see in 2021 that historical work looks a little bit like this. We find our primary archival sources by Googling for them. We go to archival websites, we go to digitized finding aids, we help find records of interest. And crucially at every stage, we're always navigating what has been digitized and placed on the, on the internet and what hasn't been digitized? Some archives are worth traveling to, but that's in a context of so much being found online that that calculus is different. That online resources are consulted more and non-digitized resources are consulted less. And then even then, when we actually get on that plane, we travel to that archive, we take thousands of photographs and then we read them at home, we sit in our home offices, we spend a week at an archive instead of a month or a month instead of a half year. That really most of our sources are coming in over a network. That historians are approaching our sources through the power of search. We're using keyword search rather than expert indexes put together, rather than as I'll show hopefully in an evocative example shortly, um, rather than skimming, which is nearly impossible in our current information interfaces. And that we tend to consult the digitized rather than the most relevant. And we, I'll explain this in newspapers. We cite digitized newspapers far more than we cite those that are still on microfilm. And it really is the Matthew effect of historical research, that the digitized gets more cited and the non-digitized gets less cited. Now, 2021 is sort of an awkward year to pick because of course we're living through a global pandemic. But as with everything, COVID has accelerated, but not invented any of these trends. Right now, we're all gathering remotely during COVID. We're doing this over Zoom, but presumably all of us have been able to do some research over the last year. Um, and we've been able to do it through these forces I talk about in this presentation. But what I'm talking about today is not the COVID age, it's the digital age. That COVID has accelerated this trend and it has made clear how digitally mediated our work is, but that these are processes that have been going on for two decades. That once you want to be provocative, you can say that almost everything we do is mediated through the internet. How we find our sources, how we share our sources, how we annotate our sources, how we think about our sources. That, well, scholarship might look the same if you look at every step of what we do. The day-to-day -day research workflow of a historian has undergone dramatic transformation. 
And I can see this in my own life, um, which is possibly why I'm interested in this. I, I finished my undergraduate degree in 2006 and my PhD in 2012. My first visit to an archive in 2005, I had to take handwritten notes because I couldn't take a camera into the reading room. Um, I don't even think I had a laptop that would have worked. I couldn't afford photocopying. It was a very analog process. By 2009, my PhD research was done exclusively through digital photography. And by the 2000s, I essentially do all my work online. I take tens of thousands of PDFs. I take them from the Internet Archive. I sit with my iPad in an easy chair and I work with them. So hopefully by this part of the talk, you're kind of agreeing with me that there's been a dramatic change in how historians do their work. But strangely, this transformation has been rarely theorized or discussed. And because we haven't really explicitly grappled with how this sort of scholarship is changing, I worry that there's a gulf taking place. That younger historians might not know what research was like before the internet, which is really important when we critique or understand how earlier scholarship was formed. And I think for older ones, um, the changes have been so gradual that we haven't always realized until we look back 20 years and see how dramatically everything has changed. It's sort of like the um, you know, apocryphal story of the frog in the boiling water in the pot, that all of it happened so slowly um, that we haven't realized how our scholarship has become so different that it would be almost unrecognizable to somebody from just a few decades before that over the last 20 years, it's hard to think of a single element of a historian's work that has not changed. And my talk thus explores this transformation to argue that we need to use this framing way as a method for understanding how historical knowledge has been produced over the last decades. Now, part of this is important, uh, and I'll mention this a little because I know we have an interdisciplinary audience today, is that because we have to, of course, know that historians are not objective. That I think there's sometimes a popular tendency to see historians as objective and to see archives as uncritically passing the past on to us in the future. But of course, a lot of my scholarship really looks at the way that historians work are influenced by their working conditions. That it really matters when a historian's doing historical research, um, you know, did they read their document on a screen or not? Did they have funding or not? Do they have the technical ability to use these platforms, whether it's JSTOR or ProQuest or, or Google Ngram Viewer? And even beyond that, and I think this will be key during COVID, you know, did they have kids or not? Were they affected by the pandemic? In which ways? All of this, you know, comes into our written pages and changes the way we understand the past. Now, when I talk about how this transformation has taken place, um, you know, from non-digital to digital, I do always want to underscore that it's not, not, it's not something that can be boiled down to a good thing or a bad thing. That our move onto the network, our move into getting our sources digitally isn't good, it isn't bad, but it's here. It's a transformation and it's not something that's likely to be reversed. And when we think about what we've gained over this last 20 years of transformation, we can see that historians have rapid access to sources, we can fact check, I can click, I can see a document, I can decide if, hey, I actually did get this right when I was sleep deprived and looking at this document two months ago. I have the ability to search over decades and continents of digitized material. I think arguably we are getting better work-life balance, we're more productive, we spend less time sitting in archival reading rooms, more time with our families. And on balance, at our fingertips, we have more information than ever before. But all of these amazing things can conceal the losses. That because of the way we interact with our sources, we're losing context. And context, of course, is what makes historians special. That we are keyword searching rather than skimming. We're searching data we don't understand. Historians often don't understand the systems we use. They're the epitome of the black box where a question comes in and a result comes out. Some sources are digitized, many, many more are not. The sort of great undigitized that I worry will be lost from sight. We're losing experiential knowledge of place. And do we lose something when we stop working with the physical documents and begin to work with digital reproductions? Now, I'm a na naturally positive person. It's a transformation, it's on the net being a positive thing. And I think it can be a positive thing because once we start thinking about the losses, we can begin to consciously think about how we could read context back into digital platforms. We can be better trained, we can be more conscious of how to use these systems. We can think about the biases and algorithms that transform our world. 
but we need to think about more about what we value as a profession and think about what we're losing when we don't go to Paris to the reading room, but rather are reading Parisian documents on a screen. So my provocative question then is, does our use of network communication mean that we are all digital historians now? That many of you are probably familiar with the emerging subfield in historical scholarship, that of capital H, digital history, the field of historical work exploring the impact that new media and other technologies have on the study of history. But I increasingly worry that by setting up a subfield of special historians who work with the digital, we will ignore that we are all digital now. That I think all historians, we're not capital D, capital H digital historians, but we are certainly all lowercase d, lowercase h digital historians as technology impacts all of our work. And I worry that our focus on the former, our focus on this new field of digital history makes the rest of us think we're not digital historians as we fire up our web browser and do all of our research from home. And I like to mention this and I'll take a very brief detour into archival theory to show that of course we know that the way sources are mediated transform the histories that we write. And we know this because when we look to archives, even traditional archives, we know that the way archives are constructed transforms historical scholarship. That archives co-create knowledge. But if we think about how something goes from an event to ending up in a book that I'm writing, we can see it here on this page where an event has happened, a document has been recorded about a fraction of them, where someone later interviews somebody or writes down some memories. A fraction, you know, 5% maybe, uh, 1 to 5% of these documents get actively selected for inclusion in an archive. An archivist brings order to that, they describe it, they arrange it, they put it in a box or they digitize it. And then a historian discovers something in this mass of knowledge that, of course, is selectively curated um, and built. That historians, and this may be surprising to those who aren't historians, that that seems obvious to me, but historians still, as Alexandra Walsham has argued in a recent um, past and present uh, special issue, historians still tend to basically treat the way that we gather knowledge as sort of archives as neutral and unproblematic reservoirs of historical fact. And I'm convinced by Bluen and Rosenberg's argument that any visit by a historian to an ar archival institution is now an exercise in interdisciplinarity. That every time we use sources, we are being interdisciplinary because we don't always understand that the knowledge and the different biases and approaches that have gone into constructing this material. And that um, this has been made, and there's a wonderful argument by uh, Terry Cook, the, the late Canadian archivist um, who published in both archives and historical scholarship, arguing that, of course, archive, archivists are co-creating the archive through appraisal. That the digital did not invent information abundance. Uh, you know, here on this slide, you see the explosion of documentary records on papal records um, by the 13th and 14th century. But that there's always been too much. If 50,000 documents a year are being created, those aren't all going to be preserved and passed on. They're going to be actively manipulated. And we see this, and this is my last slide in our little detour into archival theory. Our archivist colleagues, of course, have realized this for years. Their early approaches tended to see archivists as archival custodians, so sort of handmaidens of history, passing information uncritically on to the present. But by the 1970s, there's this idea of post-custodialism, that we have arch activist archivists who are transforming and shaping the record. And technology is challenging this archival theory yet again. So this detour then really is just to underscore that just as archivists and archives have mediated the past, surely so too do the new internet-based workflows that we use in the digital age. That just as archives influence histories, so too do digital platforms. Now at this point in the talk about the halfway point, let's go into detail to a few case studies to see how this transformation has played out, to see what it looks like to use these systems um, and try to do some research um, and how these platforms skew the way that we do our scholarship. And I think the natural place to go in this talk is of course newspapers, because newspapers over the last 20 years have seen probably the most dramatic change in how we do scholarship. Because in 2001, um, and really 2001, as I'll mention, is when the first newspapers are digitized. If you wanted to look at a newspaper, you essentially went to microfilm. 
So you'd go inevitably to a dark basement, um, probably because of the weight of microfilm machines, but in my case, always basements. You'd go to a dark basement, you'd get a reel off a rack, and you'd put it into the machine, and you'd slowly, painstakingly scroll forward, 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 through hundreds and hundreds of pages of microfilm. It was time consuming, it was boring, it was really a good chance to listen to music, but in doing so, you learned a lot about context. So as someone who spent months doing microfilm, you're cranking through, it takes you forever to find the hits that you're looking for, but as you're going through, you might see, hey, there was this global event. Oh, really people are talking about in 1973 about this incident. Um, and hey, my document is on page 19, or my document is on page three, and that tended to be a page where prominent activities is, you just basically get a sense of what's going on. The tenor of advertisements, the relative placements of columnists or articles, et cetera. But starting in 2001 um, and accelerating in past the 2010s, historians have dramatically switched away from that towards keyword searching. And I was curious about this uh, during COVID, I asked our, our university librarian, um, University of Waterloo, we're a big university, about 40,000 students. Um, and I said, has anybody in the last 18 months tried to use the microfilm machine? And she said, one student, your student, um, who you forced to go look at microfilm. Otherwise, these machines have sit unused during our entirety of the COVID pandemic. And that's because nobody's using microfilm. We're using keyword searches. We go here, we type in our search terms, and we find information. But the problem with it is that it seems like you're searching everything. It seems like a perfect interface. It seems like a perfect replacement for that microfilm um, sort of workflow. But of course, a lot of stuff is missing. So I'll provide this example. This was from, um, this is a search I did a few months ago. I was giving a talk at Queen's University in uh, Canada where, where I did my undergrad. One of the famous moments in Queen's University's history was President Roosevelt came in August of 1938, gave this famous speech. And if you listen to the official history of Queen's, it was sort of where the Second World War was decided. Um, so I decided let's pull up some newspaper articles for it. I typed in the words Kingston and Roosevelt. Um, and I received no hits. And I said, why is this? This is one of the most significant events, you know, arguably in Canada in August of 1938. Why is there no discussion of this speech by the American president? So then I dug in and I found, actually, if we go to 1938, we see that August of 1938 is entirely missing. That for some reason, there is no digitized information from August of 1938. That's my initial thought was maybe it was the Great Depression. Maybe they stopped publishing for a calendar month. That's not true. I went in to look at the September issues and they're referring back in the letters to the editors about articles written in August of 1938. But crucially, if the historian was just sitting there, was just doing keyword searches, was just reading the hits they had, they would have no clue that an entire month was missing from, from, this, from this database. That this was the first month I went looking for because of FDR and this sort of historical moment. And it makes you wonder what other gaps there are. That the data is incomplete, but search makes it feel complete. So you begin to miss things, but importantly, you don't know that you're missing things. And of course, the data that you're searching on is also created. It's not being painstakingly manually transcribed. It's created by optical character recognition. Um, the implementation we're seeing here was actually the first newspaper in the world digitized was the Toronto Star, but it's 20 year old OCR, doesn't catch line break hyphenation. You know, even if we took the best case scenario of 98%, you know, that's word accuracy is about 90%. That people are using these databases, they're missing a lot and they don't know. But we can't blame them because once it comes time to actually use the scholarship, you can't really skim it. And so here I am, I decide I want to do what I did in my PhD. I want to read a bunch of newspapers from the 60s. This would be me sitting in the basement looking at 1968. Let's go here to September 1968 in the Toronto Star. You know, we load it up. And you'll see from my sort of exploration on this web browser here that it's really, really challenging for me to go um, one page at a time. So here I load up. We can see that first page. For some reason this day, the forward button interface isn't working. So I have to start manually going into the pages. The 
The text is too small to read. So eventually I might want to download the text. I can try zooming in on my system. It's not quite there. I have to download the PDF, open up my PDF reader, and then I can zoom in and read it. And I mentioned this extended example because skimming is impossible, but the system is forcing us to keyword search, that these platforms are guiding our behavior. And of course, digitization is uneven. Thinking back to that Matthew effect I mentioned in my introduction, here we have Canadian newspapers, and we can see here, um, this is the period when they were not digitized. The Toronto Star gets digitized in 2001, and we can see three years later in 2005, it ends up being cited hundreds of percentage points more than it had ever been cited before. So there's the Globe, there's the Star, both of which are early digitized. And we can see that other newspapers were cited less before, but they're cited far less now. That to me, it's a perfect example of a phenomenon we know, which is that the more something is digitized, the more it is used, i.e. the Star and the Globe are used more than before, the Toronto Telegram is almost never used, and of course the mediation of a source impacts its use. Now we can scale this forward and think about the global impact of this. And here I'm indebted to the work of Laura Putnam, who wrote this masterful article in the American Historical Review, The Transnational and the Tech Searchable. And I think she's bang on when she thinks about what it means that we have the ability to search across oceans and continents and think about the global impact of digitization. But as she says, technology has exploded the scope and speed of discovery, but our ability to read accurately the sources we find and evaluate their significance cannot magically accelerate a pace. The more far flung the locales linked through our discoveries, the less consistent our contextual knowledge. The place-specific learning that historical research in a pre-digital world required is no longer baked into the process. We make rookie mistakes. But as she puts it, we have the sidelines. I can sit in Waterloo, see a reference to something that happened in Oxford or Paris or Mumbai, and what do I do? I turn to Wikipedia, I turn to the Hattie Trust, I turn to Google Books, I turn to Google. And I fact check things. I take side glances across time and space and bring in international examples into my scholarship. And as Putnam explains, the impact of such side glancing, formerly rare, as before the digital age, if I saw in archive something happened in Mumbai, I would probably shrug and I wouldn't follow that rabbit hole. But as we now have it, it's now quoted in. It requires nanoseconds to search, minutes to read, and it's profound. It routinizes peripheral vision that opens us up to the possibility of cross-border by dynamics of manifold scales and kinds. That we can do this digital scholarship, but when I search for something in Mumbai, I don't really know what's being digitized in Mumbai. I don't know what the local politics of digitization are. I don't really know anything about it. I'm just doing a keyword search, clicking on the first few links, and that finds its way into my scholarship, which is profound as it unlocks global scholarship, but also scary because we're doing things we don't understand. That what are we losing when we sit in our desks, our basements and offices, um, and we can go back to our offices, and we devalue place-based expertise in favor of search. And it raises all of these interesting questions to me about place and the global, when we start to go, could you be a leading historian of the Winnipeg general strike without ever having been to Winnipeg or having been just for two days? Can you be a Nigerian historian without having been to Nigeria? And what do we gain or lose when our interactions with, with archives are measured in clicks? What about our relationships with fellow researchers, with libraries, with archivists, etc.? And of course, it's so important to remember that as so much becomes digitized, still, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Most things remain undigitized. That just as the Star and Globe are used more than ever before, so too are the digitized archival resources. They're digitized because they're popular, so they're put online. Nobody, people in the archives profession are surprisingly driven, like all of us, by metrics and hits and proving to their managers that they digitize this right collection on their annual report. But that means you don't digitize things you don't think people are gonna read. You digitize things that people are going to read and you shape scholarship accordingly. So as I approach the end of my talk, um, let's take stock of this. Our, our work in archives has been transformed. We're profoundly affected by what's online and what's not. And our work in digital newspapers and other digitized resources is transformed as we're drawn towards the digitized, but our platforms drive us away from contextually aware research influenced by algorithms we don't understand. So what should we do? 
Well, I always like to end my, I have three minutes left of my talk, so I want to try to end with some broader points of how we might begin to change the humanities to sort of overcome these barriers and get us back on the gain side of the ledger. And I think, first of all, it's realizing that, you know, our level of digital literacy, and I'm going to I talk about history, but it's really the humanities more, more widely. We need to realize that all historians have been transformed by these forces, whether they are digital historians or not that all of our sources are mediated through technology and that consciously thinking about this, citing our mediated sources will make us better and more transparent historians. That historians shy away from methods, we hide them in our footnotes and our editors try to get rid of them, but we need to be conscious in our writing about, hey, I chose this archive because of COVID. I chose this archive because it was digitized and here's what I might've lost by opting for the convenience and the breadth of the digitized sources rather than the you know, unfeasible conventional research. But we need to recognize that interdisciplinarity is core to all of us. That it sounds silly, but I think really using a search engine or a database, once you start thinking of it as an exercise in interdisciplinarity, just like when you think of going to an archives as engaging in interdisciplinarity, that's important. That we need to read the literature, we need to talk to librarians. That for historians, we still think in geography and not method. Um, if there's historians in the room, you know we are American historians, we're British historians, we're Canadian historians, and that means methods falls in the cracks. So we need to foreground method. We need to think about digital literacy. We need to think about methods. And we need to think about what it means to be a historian that isn't about time and space, but is about craft and algorithm. That we need to change how we train, um, our required undergrad methods courses in North America are relatively rare. Graduate education is all about content, not craft. We do all of our training, and I'd be curious if it's different in the UK. I don't think it really is. We learn through an apprentice model, which is great, but it means you're taught by somebody who came up through the system 20 to 25 years ago and may have missed these sort of major paradigm and medium shifts. But as I say here, some of this is happening in dribs and drabs. Uh, the Canadian and American Historical Review have done special sections and foras. The American Historical Association Conference has these great roundtables, not so much my own Canadian Historical Association. But to me, this is like a defining issue of our time. Historians are becoming a desk discipline. And what does that mean? To editorialize, I think too rarely, a Canadian historian and a medieval historian rarely cross paths professionally. And I think because we focus on content and time, we're losing something with that. And as I said, my focus is on history as that's my discipline, but many of these issues cut across disciplinary silos. And I really think all of our students, you know, I said humanities, social sciences, and really just everybody need an awareness of algorithmic bias, need an understanding of how content is mediated, contextualized, need better digital literacy skills. We need to break down these silos. But just as a historian needs better digital skills to understand something, um, they so too do to evaluate COVID news and vaccine pros and cons and all of that information they're barraged with on a daily basis. Um, vaccine pros far outweigh the cons, which are non-existent, but well, that's just me editorializing because we're having debates in Canada. Um, so I'll just uh, say in conclusion then, the historical profession is being transformed by new and emerging digital technologies. We haven't sufficiently engaged with this shift. It's mostly good, but being self-conscious and aware will make sure we understand the resources and approaches we're drawing on. In other words, we're all digital now, let's embrace it. So at that point, I will thank you all and I believe turn it back to Professor Schrader for uh, our conversation. And I have lost my camera, so I will just speak <laughs> for the moment, at least. Thanks so much, Ian. That was really great. Um, we have a number of questions already, so um, I will uh, not take my prerogative as the chair and ask the first one because I have a, I have several in reserve, so to speak. But I will just. Um, start straight away and really you've given us a uh, fantastic food for thought can i ask you terry zhang actually asks you the first question so he wants to know um how do we address the we don't know what we don't know problem 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a good one to start with, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Thanks, Terry. Thanks again for also uh, making these these introductions. Um, that's a really that's a really tough tough question. Um, I don't I don't think there's a canonical answer to that. Um, that would be my first my first take on that. Um, I think the best ways that historians are answer, addressing this question is getting into the weeds. Um, so a good historian with an analog, even with traditional archives, understands their archives. So, and they often do that implicitly. So when I did 1960s research in Canada, I got to know the archives because I was there for six months. And so I would talk to the archives assistant on the desk. I would talk to the archivists. I would get to know the finding aids and I would actually begin to know the gaps. And I would say, you know, the collection of this very famous new leftist activist in Canada, they are not included in this archive. And eventually the story comes out, you know, in this case, it was a debate over income tax valuation. Just they couldn't come to the right deed of gift to get these, this archive collected. And so I knew writing this book, you know, 20% of what I might expect to find wasn't there. And when it comes to digital sources, I think, unfortunately, we're sort of in the same way. So I know a lot about the Internet Archive. I know a lot about the GeoCities collection, which I've used. And I mostly know that because I've hung out at the Internet Archive. I'm on the Slack for the Internet Archive. We have, when we had in-person conferences, we would talk, you know, you go to the bar and you kind of collect information about these things. Um, and it takes a lot of time. And that's because I've been fortunate to focus on collections. So I think probably the best way to do that is to really up the um, up the level of metadata and historians engaging with collection level metadata and encouraging and funding the ability for libraries and archives to provide lots of descriptive information so they can begin to say, here's what's in our collection and here's what's not in our collection. Um, and then for historians to take that seriously and normalize thinking about that, if that makes sense. So just being transparent about our work and, and really trying to make sure there's some support for people to describe the archives that they create. Right, and it also sounds like there's a lot of legwork involved. <laughs> I mean, in other words, you're saying that you you really, you, you can't just uh, do the digital part. You also kind of have to look at the context all around it. And that's how you, yeah. how you know what we don't know, or part of it at least, I guess. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, and it's scary to think that all of this sort of rich knowledge that, you know, I, I might have about IA collections or, um, you know, traditional archives I've used, wouldn't have been matched the number of times I probably have sat down and Googled a query, searched an archive, and then drawn an inference from that archive and having absolutely no clue what was really in that archive or not in that archive. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's on both of us. It's on archives and libraries to provide better metadata. Funding is such a, a problem there. But it's on us to critically think when I do that Google search or I play around in the Heidi Trust or on uh, JSTOR ProQuest, just think about, okay, what's here? What's not? What am I actually doing? Um, and it sounds simple, but it's really, really hard because search is such a part of our life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's great. Let's move on to the next question, which is equally good, I think. Uh, that is, I mean, you've kind of addressed it, but I think it's worth kind of pinpointing you on this. Is digital history coded by the winners? Yeah, it, by that, I know it's for an anonymous attendee, so I, I'd, it's hard for me to unpack that. So like, is it defined by the winners? Um, I, I think, you know, it, it could be, there could be a kind of code part and there could be a kind of winners and losers in digital history part. If yeah. You so, I mean, I guess you could take both of those. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly there are, there's capital H digital history, which I think is, um, it's a small field. We're at a sort of opportune moment now where things can branch out. Um, can, bra can branch out into, into new areas because it's not like the digital humanities, which I think does have a more of a sort of sense of what it is, as little as that is, in a way that we don't. Um, so I think it's still an opportunity to be expansive about, about what it is. Right, um, right. I mean, I guess one of, one, one of your answers here is that even if it is coded by digital winners, we can do our best to change that. Yeah. Is that one way to put it? Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. And I, and I think we're at the perfect moment to do that because it's such a junior field and we're just beginning to think about the impact of technology. Right, right, excellent. Let's move on to the next one here. Uh, these are great questions. So, um, oops, 
uh, let me, so um, impact on different disciplines. For example, an early modernist, are they impacted differently from a medievalist? Yes, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So I think, I mean, if I, to get into the weeds, I mean, I think one of the big changes um, is the advent of typesetting, um, which changes the way that we can engage with sources. So we've got OCR, that really opens up the 20th century once we're moving away from handwritten to typewritten documents. OCR is not perfect, but it does allow for this explosion of searchable databases. So I think the early, like early modernists and medievalists, the problem is until relatively recently, those sources have been resistant to the mass kind of access by keyword search, et cetera. But it's amazing how quickly that's changing. So I, I'm working with a student at Waterloo. Um, she is a, she, she's an early modernist and she's been using a program called Transcribus, which is this amazing you know, European funded project that um, uses handwritten text, text recognition, tries to do for OCR, what OCR did to text, it does for um, handwritten documents, and it really does it through machine learning. Um, so that, that's been such an advent. And it's been interesting to see how she uses digital methods to work with these you know, massive scrolls that uh, she gets archivists in the United Kingdom to unfurl them and take photographs for her. She comes and then she trains a machine learning algorithm to start extracting the text. And there's cleanup and it's not as smooth, but it's beginning to become clear that she can build this massive corpus of data and work with it in the same way. Mm -hmm. and, and the other things hold true, like uh, I, I've just been seeing it, you know, firsthand she works a lot with Sussex, the, the records office of Sussex, because they're, they're great. There's digitized stuff, there's other scholarship. They're really good with engaging, um, great to digitize. And then there's some other records offices elsewhere in England um, that aren't there. And you can actually see, you only got four years to do your PhD in Canada, you're steered towards you know, it's only ethical for me to steer you towards the sources that uh, that are feasible, right? And so you do see again that Matthew effect in shaping her scholarship, even though she's working on the early modern period. Excellent, thank you so much. Great, and now we have a question which moves us onto web sources and which um, I can, I'm just gonna read it out here. I'm sure you've read it, but um, so when we get into the uh, area of web sources, where the creation of archives is decentralized and de distributed among citizens on the one hand and social media companies or others on the other hand with their biased algorithms, how does that kind of affect the role of historians or humanists? Yeah, that's a, you know, I, I keep saying a great question because um, these are really thoughtful questions. Um, you know, they require us, I think, to, again, it comes to context, understanding the context of the way that these archives are created. Um, so I give a historical example and then a contemporary one. I mean, historically, I do a lot of work with the Internet Archive, and the Internet Archive's early holdings are heavily skewed, sort of in a way along this. Users installed the Alexa toolbar, which was this sort of path-based navigation system, as users crawled the web or surfed the web using the Alexa toolbar installed, Alexa internet would crawl these sites and then they'd later end up in the internet archive. So our entire sort of late nineties internet history is heavily shaped by a subset of users who had the Alexa toolbar installed and navigated sites. And so as a historian, when you wanna use the late 1990s internet archive, you need to know that, um, that not everything is there and the things that are there are going to skew to the interests of people who had the Alexa toolbar installed. So in my case, I've dived in, I'm doing, a, doing some research on the Alexa toolbar right now, diving in, you're reading, you know, internet publications, periodicals, et cetera, trying to get a feel for, you know, in 1997, who would have been the person who used Alexa toolbar versus someone who hadn't. Um, so context is key. And that's today, we, we, I've done some work with Twitter collecting. So if we wanna create an event-based web archive, it's happening so quickly, you can't sit down even with a large team and say, these are the hundred websites we need to gather to have the canonical record of, you know, the capital invasion or this election or, or COVID rollout in a country. Um, so we tend to use, you know, what were, we did some experiments with like, hey, let's curate what people are tweeting and use that as an archive to complement what curators are doing. And again, there it requires, you know, lots of context, going to Pew Internet and finding out, hey, what are the demographics of these internet users, breaking down their user bios as best we can, who's contributing information, and just 
writing and documenting and making our metadata as robust as possible so that in 20 years, somebody can use an archive we've created um, and understand the context and thought that went into that and, and deconstruct that. So again, it's information. I, I don't think there's any way to have perfectly de-biased archives or, or anything. They're all gonna have pros and cons and it's really gonna require documentation and thought to make it possible. Right, right, very good. And now here's a slightly different question, uh, which is about Wikipedia, where multiple truths exist and certain versions of persons or organizations are dominant. I mean, what do you think about how that impacts historians and students who rely on sources like Wikipedia? Personally, I think Wikipedia can be a wonderful resource, but uh, how do you think that plays out among historians and, and student historians in particular? Yeah, and that's a, it's a great question because Wikipedia is the kind of source that for ages historians said don't use Wikipedia and then our students use Wikipedia. Um, so we kind of had to go where students were and think about how to thoughtfully use Wikipedia. But I think in some ways it's an opportunity because we know that Wikipedia um, is biased. Um, we know that you know people are putting up vanity pages. We know that some organizations are more militant. We know that certain editors Claim, claim militant ownership over a page and heaven forbid anybody try to contest the interpretation that they're advancing on that web page. And so my, my option, I, I've used Wikipedia in teaching mainly because it's a way, thanks to the talk page, thanks to then looking at who's writing this, let's look at other contributions they've made, is you can kind of open up the, open up the process of historical production in a way you can't for other things. Um, so, I think in some ways it's an opportunity because if you read Encyclopedia Britannica um, or other sole authored publications or you know national biographies of, of the United Kingdom or Canada, they're sole authored, but those are also biased. And I know this because I've contributed or I've read contributions and know the people writing these things. And I don't have the ability to go in and see the talk page or see the contestation and stuff like that. Um, so I think in some ways it's good. We, we have the ability to go in and talk about these truths, talk about um, how there are biases and debates and, um, you know, thinking critically about, hey, why, why is this a hagiographic hey, take on this? And you go into the talk page, you go with the contributor's history and you can actually see why that might be taking shape. Um, right. So right. yeah, it's an opportunity, I think, just as much as a challenge. Right, right, very good. Um, I'm going to take uh, Erica's question here next whose question is a very practical one. Uh, I mean, if you have an interdisciplinary research topic, how do you know which department to apply for, for a PhD program? And, you know, if I can just uh, jump in there myself, OII would not be a perfect place for many topics because digital history is unfortunately, well, it's somewhat represented, but it's only partially represented. And I know Catherine's in the chat or a participant, but um, you know, where do you go, uh, Ian? What do you think? It's a, it's, it's a tough challenge. Um, and I, I don't wanna to give too prescriptive advice because I know my, my knowledge is primarily, you know, mostly Canada and also the United States um, and less elsewhere. Um, but it's, it's challenging and I tend to, the advice I would give is on the one hand, think about what you want to be, that sometimes you know, I'll be talking to a student, but it becomes clear that they are, they're a historian. They view the world through the lens of historical scholarship, that they're profoundly interested in the profession of history and in that intellectual lineage, in which case it makes sense for history. Um, alternatively, sometimes they're very interdisciplinary in the United States and Canada, it tends to be, you know, maybe that's a faculty of information type project where you can see these weaving of perspectives. But my, my main advice, Erica, would be, you know, talk outreach to supervisors. Um, like at Waterloo, I'm, in a, I'm a sole practitioner. I'm the only digital historian in my department. Um, but I've supervised students because we have great digital humanists in English. We have colleagues interested in the digital humanities and computer science. I have these networks. Um, and so we, you know, whenever I've supervised students, I've tended to build committees from other departments and kind of forged an interdisciplinary experience. But again, if you just looked at my website really briefly, or you looked at our department webpage, um, you'd really have no clue that that existed. So I think you're doing the first step. You start asking, uh, you do outreach to potential supervisors, 
And if they can't do that project, they might know exactly the place to do it, if that makes sense. And I think it really is sending emails. We're all friendly. Most digital historians, especially, we're a little bit lonely because we're sole <laughs> practitioners in most departments. We love to chat and think about, you know, candidly, what the next step for somebody should be if they want to build a career in this area. Right. I think that's a great answer. And I think you might have one or two emails coming your way asking for yeah, advice. Please, please do. <laughs> Um, this is great. So next question is by somebody who I'm co-supervising in the history department here at Oxford. And Dan wants to know, okay, so how is the, the kind of metric, uh, uh, how are metrics affecting digital historical scholarship? I mean, do we, as he asks, risk a quantitative increase over a qualitative decline, if you like? Uh, especially when you think about how older generations of historians might have had to spend a lot more time getting to know their period's context. I should add that Dan is actually doing his PhD about kind of Silicon Valley and its culture in the 1990s and so on. So fantastic topic, but please go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. It, and Dan, it'd be great to connect because I'm looking at Internet Archive in the 90s as well. Um, so there might be some overlap on that Silicon Valley side. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the core question you raise is true that because it's easier to do historical scholarship and the labor market challenges of historians and other humanities and social science disciplines, I think we are seeing a rising, a raising of the bar. The idea that you know you can do archival research much more quickly than before and so accordingly there's a little bit of a race to get scholarship out there that said i, I think this is sometimes when historians are in close um close connection to social scientists we sometimes feel like we need to get more papers and i in the north american context i think the emphasis is still quality over quantity um and that's because at the stages of hiring, at the stages of tenure and promotion in the North American context, we still really do rely on these external assessments. We really do want to see good stuff that necessarily a long litany of like salami sliced papers doesn't necessarily build you in the same way that, that a, few, a few papers go. And I think sometimes one of the downsides of discourse on Twitter and other social media networks around a scholar, you know, there was some meme or unfortunate incident a few weeks ago where somebody said I published 100 papers in seven years and everybody got all angry about that um, but of course in some social science disciplines you do publish 10 papers a year and in history you might publish one paper every two years and that that would be seen as fine so I I do think there's a, a risk going on but I think a lot of the pressures to get people competitive is just as much the impact of the labor market and the, the rising standards that we've had there that I wouldn't necessarily see that we need to most historians are still not on a pump out papers to be productive metric, at least in North America. Right, right, that's great to hear. Now we have a question from a historian doing research on the Cold War in Latin America. And uh, they say their work is closer to your view of how historians used to work a long time ago in 2001. How do you get people in the global south uh, to bring in digital history methods when most of our resources are still analog? That's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, and it, I mean, two things, I mean, obviously these are the barriers and this is sort of what uh, Laura Putnam's work, which you're probably familiar with, um, and if not, it's really worth reading, is that you're right, when I start, start searching in Chile, I'm going to find digitized sources, but you as an expert know that those are just the tip of the iceberg and wildly unrepresented given all that. Um, once you dig in, I mean, I think the real, the potential of digital history scholarship comes in, if you're taking lots of digital photographs and you're doing it in a sort of rigorous way, there are cool ways to do OCR and do some text analysis and create your own research database, and there's some cool blog posts of people who've done that. Um, and I think also worthwhile thinking about metadata. So presumably, again, I don't know your, your collections. Um, there's metadata resources. There might be some opportunity to look at the relationships in metadata and think about the skewing of the metadata of those archives. But that said, I, I know in some places even finding aids aren't digitized and you're probably starting from scratch. So it's obviously a, a big barrier. And I see Maria published a chapter which popped up on my Google Scholar actually uh, recently, I haven't read it yet. Um, but that uh, could be really cool. 
Excellent, excellent. And uh, now we have a question from which I expected to come earlier. So I'm curious if there have been efforts to preserve the data from the social media platforms. And that has been a big discussion, but uh, if you could say something about that, I mean, even Yahoo Answers and things like that may be disappearing. How, how do we deal with that when things become locked or encrypted because of yeah. digital? Yeah, so, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Yahoo Answers, is a, there's actually an article in The Atlantic that just came out on some of the efforts to preserve Yahoo Answers. Um, which is being led, you know, an archives grabbing a lot of it. There's also this sort of guerrilla, guerrilla archivist team, archive team. Um, and they, because there's some of those rate limits, like if you try to go in and download all of Yahoo Answers, Yahoo will lock you out. So they run networks of virtual machines by dozens of volunteers around the world to sort of collectively grab that data. Um, you know, you mentioned Twitter. Twitter is a platform that probably will be fairly well preserved. Um, until relatively recently, Library of Congress was trying to preserve it. That fell apart due to some complicated reasons, but they do have at least a partial archive of Twitter. And lots of people are collecting data. Twitter has a very robust API um, and there's lots of sort of collecting going on by social scientists and humanists all around the world and computer scientists and firehose training sets and that sort of thing, because Twitter, except for locked accounts is really amenable to mass harvesting. WhatsApp is a neat one because I think of WhatsApp as sort of like private Facebook. Um, WhatsApp is probably not going to be preserved, sort of like your email. You might see individual people who are curating their digital footprint might donate that at some point, but as a mass scale, um, I wouldn't expect that to be preserved. I wouldn't. I would think the ethical problems of all the private WhatsApp chats um, in things like that to, to raise insurmountable obstacles. So, you know, sort of like my text messages. You know, there's some possibility that one day my text messages will end up in an archive if I become famous or something. But uh, otherwise, I would expect those to all be private and would be massively curated in any case if they ended up. Um, yeah, and, and I think it just in general, I, I'm working on this, but the Internet Archive and the national libraries around the world have really been taking a leadership role in preserving digital data for the last 20 years. Um, so often we look to the Internet Archive for a lot of leadership, but also... Um, the British Library does amazing work. The BNF does amazing work. Um, many others do great work to preserve all this material. Yeah. Thank God for the Internet Archive. Yes. I think that, that's worth repeating often. Um, we just have time for a few more things. And I'm just going to take a few more things here at once. Uh, the name of the software for transcribing text into digital that the early modern student is using, that can probably be answered quite quickly. Yep. Yeah. So Maria's right. That's Transcribus. Um, right. And, and they are, though they have a payment model, they are also free. They're very open, I gather, to working with doctoral students and you can get tons of credits. So they're, they're really great to work with. Right. And there's a long question here, but I'll just uh, cut to the chase. How does one introduce the people who are doing only remote work and digerati, as they're called here, to research on actual paper-based publications? Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think it's, I think of the way that I work um, and you can see the sort of benefit to print materials is, you know, twofold. I think, you know, and I try to get my students to go to a physical archive at some point just to see what it's like, even if, as, as Jack mentioned, they're mostly doing remote work. Um, but I also think, you know, the Internet Archive, which is getting even easier to work with as researchers, they have a lot of collect, complete collections. And so that can often be a really good gateway is if you, you work with the Internet Archive, you know, it's still a little bit tricky. You need to like use your Python library or some command line stuff, but you can download like an entire collection. And then, so I download an entire collection. I put it on my OneDrive. I then read it on my iPad. Um, and I find that really good because it's just everything. I'm not doing keyword searches. I'm doing collection level skim. And it sort of introduces you to go, hey, there's, there's actually something to benefit to me reading thousands of pages of documents and not trying to keyword search it and you know that might encourage somebody that to next go in and, and look at a physical archive right right interesting and we have the last question which is actually a rather futuristic one <laughs> you've seen it but uh, can we conceive of a post-human archive would you find it important to consider translating archiving history for in alternative intelligences hmm interesting Ooh. 
that's a, that's cool. I to be like a science fiction book in some ways. I, I don't really know. I, and I think it's so hard to know what the future holds when it comes to that and how to structure our data that um, I think it's always important to keep an eye on new technologies. I, I've taught a course on artificial intelligence with some colleagues, for example. Um, and it's just good to know what's going on so we can think about future proofing our archives and keeping it, you know, in a preservationable and ac accessible format and trying to stay away from proprietary file formats, things like that. So just future proofing and, you know, thinking archive ready material might, might help with these sort of, you know, interesting conceptualizations of an archive that might come in the future. Right, right. That's a perfect answer. And a perfect note to end on and almost on time, Ian, thank you so much. You've given us a lot of food for thought and we really look forward to your Cambridge Elements book too, which uh, I think will kind of open up all these debates and, and raise new ones as well. So that's really excellent that you're, that you're even thinking of the next uh, book already. Thank you again. I'm going to clap. I know you can't hear other people clap, but um, we will hopefully see you again after the pandemic. And uh, thanks again for a, a wonderful talk and, and uh, um, for enriching us with digital history. Thank you. Bye bye. Wonderful. Thanks Thank to you very our much. Audience for great questions. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks. you both so much. Uh, we really appreciate everyone coming along today and and thank you so much for such an engaging talk that you did there, um, Ian. So we really appreciate it. And thank everyone for attending as well. And you'll receive a, a follow-up email in due course. And the OAI is hosting our next webinar on Wednesday, 5th of May at five o'clock UK time, where we will speak to directors of the OAI past and present in a celebration of 20 years of the Institute. So a perfect opportunity to ask questions for the those who have been there from the start all the way through to the 20 years old this year. So please do visit the events page on the OII website to sign up and join us. Thank you again, everyone, and have a wonderful day.